All righty. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's business roundtable on the Paid Family and Medical Leave Benefits Program. I'm Everell Eaton, Executive Director of the Bar Harbor Chamber of Commerce, and have just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, today's session will be recorded and posted on the Chamber's Facebook and YouTube pages following today's session. Uh, to ensure a smooth session, please remain on mute unless you are talking. If you have a question, please use the hand raise function or the chat box. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce today's speakers, Senator Maddie Daughtry and Representative Kristen Clitier. Um, Senator Maddie Daughtry is Assistant Majority Leader in the Maine Senate. She serves on the Legislature's Joint Standing Committee on Labor and Housing, a lifelong Brunswick resident. She co-owns and brews at Moderation Brewing Company. During her time in the legislature, Senator Daughtry has authored and passed nationally recognized bills to reduce student debt, grow education funding, support older Mainers, and push for economic development. Representative Kristen Cladier um, is the Assistant House Majority Leader. She proudly represents House District 94 which includes part of Lewiston, her hometown. Um, the representative has served on both the Taxation Committee and the Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. Uh, representative Cloutier has introduced and passed legislation to uh, create a grant program to support family caregivers, to decrease barriers and streamline business licensing so qualified new residents can enter Maine's workforce, to direct $10 million to aid Mainers experiencing homelessness, and to create a more transparent process for reporting known lead paint ha hazards in housing. Prior to her time in the legislature, she was the mayor and city council uh, president of Lewiston, representing Ward 5. Thank you both for joining us today, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. Thanks for the patience while we're dealing with some uh, tech problems. And thanks for having us. Um, I think we don't need to, you did a great job introducing us, so thank you. I think maybe if we just jump right in. Um, Kristen, do you want to talk a little bit about what the last couple of years were, and then I'll talk about the states in the country? Yeah, so um, we, Maddie and I are sort of coming off a, our, is this like year three uh, of this work? Yeah. Um, so of uh, three years of working on uh, this issue, uh, we started out um, as co-chairs of the commission to develop a paid family and medical leave benefits program um, for the state. Um, and then over the past year uh, have really sort of refined that work from the commission, um, but also have embarked on a little bit of a whirlwind tour uh, doing a little bit of a dog and pony show um, across the state to really kind of um, refine the proposal that came out of the commission um, and also to hear feedback um, and incorporate changes into that proposal um, that we think makes um, a really strong and inclusive policy uh, for the state of Maine. And so on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the lay of the land. So currently Maine is the only state in New England without some sort of PFML program. Um, 13 states in Washington, D.C. have already enacted programs. You can see from that list that they're pretty diverse in both geographic region, political background, and demographics. Um, additionally, uh, state legislatures in Minnesota and Michigan um, are poised to pass statewide the FML programs this year. So when you're already dealing with an employee-driven economy, especially in the New England side, not having as an access for small and medium-sized businesses really puts us yet another step behind, especially when you consider, I apologize if anyone gives you a squeaky toy, our youngest dog is uh, playing the squeaky toys under my table right now. <laughs> Um, but with that, you know, with unemployment being at 2.4%, um, you know, this is yet another thing that sort of puts us a step behind. And Kristen, if you want to go to the next slide and you can talk about the need for it. Yeah, so um, only about 35% of workers even have access to unpaid leave right now in the state. Um, so lots of folks are having to choose between working um, and earning a paycheck. 
uh, and taking care of either themselves or their loved ones um, when they're sick. Uh, and so 90% of Mainers support a paid family and medical leave law uh, that would guarantee those folks uh, paid time off to care for loved ones and or themselves. So a little bit about what it could accomplish. Um, you know, this is at its core, we like to describe that paid family medical leave is an insurance program that provides a wage replacement for when both the best and the worst happen. So, you know, this is something that nationwide and internationally, paid family medical leave has been shown to boost worker productivity. It improves, employ improves employee retention. Um, a lot of different studies have shown, you know, as we switch to a younger workforce, a lot of those individuals are looking for this type of benefit. And multiple surveys and polls have shown that people would consider not taking a job specifically because they don't have this type of policy. It can also increase labor force participation, which we all know has been declining because folks, life happens, people will have to take leave no matter what. What this program does is it enables and empowers workers to be able to stay. Um, you know, we just have to take the time to, you know, choose between healing or getting a paycheck or caring for a loved one or bonding with a newborn. So this provides that sort of investment and insurance for Mainers. Also, as the oldest state in the nation, uh, as Kristen likes to say quite often, we are not getting any younger. Um, we really do have a giant need to help Mainers be able to age in place. And by having this type of program, you're able to you know, really take care of your loved ones and uh, have a way to be able to get them to age in place gracefully. Also, you know, the biggest thing that, you know, people tend to think about paid family medical leave, it does cover a wide juggernaut of things, but, you know, one of the most quickest things that comes to people's minds is caring for newborns. And so this really helps strengthen Maine's families. It provides uh, time for, you know, after birth, postpartum with infants, as well as maternity and paternity, uh, you know, adoption, as well as um, foster care, which, you know, we have a foster care problem here in Maine. This is a really great way we've heard from foster families that this would make a difference and really help them um, support their uh, new foster children. And with that, I think sort of, Kristen, if you want to follow up on the next few slides and then I'll jump into like what the amendment is. Yeah, so um, as we, as I sort of mentioned uh, in my my initial comments, um, Maddie and I co-chaired a commission um, and drafted a report. Um, we have been doing Zoom meetings, in-person events, uh, various stakeholder um, meetings across the state um, with over 300 individuals um, from stakeholder groups like AARP, uh, representing older Mainers, um, women, healthcare providers, local governments, lots of chambers of commerce um, and the state chamber of commerce. Uh, we've met with over 200 businesses, uh, including industry representatives from HR. Uh, Maddie, and actually, Maddie and I actually had the great opportunity to attend the HR conference um, in Rockland uh, earlier this month or late last month. I'm not really sure what month we're actually in <laughs> right now. Um, hospitality, tourism, healthcare, trades, finance, retail, um, and pretty much any any business umbrella you could imagine, um, we've we've talked to them. Um, we took all of the ideas and feedback that we received from all of these meetings, um, incorporated them into what we're calling a sponsor's amendment, which Maddie will uh, get into in a few minutes. Um, and we really feel like we have created the most collaborative um, and comprehensive um, policy um, that the state has seen. Um, it's, it's really unusual for uh, senators and representatives to sort of go out um, and collect feedback on stuff. Usually we kind of sit in this building and wait for folks to come to us. Um, and so I think we both feel really proud of the process that we've created um, and feel like we, we have a really strong product. Um, so in, in, in sort of looking at the timeline, you know, back in 2018, uh, folks who were really in favor of PFML asked us to study how a policy like this would work in the state. And so that's kind of where we started. Uh, and now we're in 2023 um, and we're presenting a policy that is based off the work of two commissions. So um, we had the initial commission and then we needed an extension because we felt like we hadn't been able to uh, complete all of the work that we wanted to. Um, we've conducted an actuarial study. We've spent more time studying the policy um, than any other state um, and 
again, the countless meetings with stakeholders. At the end of the day, I think that this will be probably the most worked piece of legislation um, that this building um, may have ever seen. Do you want to do this one, Maddie? Yeah, sure. So I know it can be a little bit confusing. One, um, as we were saying, sort of flipping the script and coming to all of you to ask for your feedback. Um, one other area that we have sort of changed how things are done is the text of the bill, if you go online for LD 1964, that's the commission report. That's a, you know, probably the largest, most robust program we could pass. And we wanted to make sure that those recommendations were part of the legislative uh, process and record. Then what we did um, on Thursday was present our sponsors amendment. Um, and we're able to sort of show where we think there needs to be movement and where things, you know, work or need changes. Uh, one thing I do want to say, this is something that came up. A lot of folks are wondering why we're seeing this bill at the end of session. And I do want to say we have, we submitted this and we're waiting for it from February. So like everyone else who's been following the bill, we too are frustrated, but we've been very grateful for conversations like this to continue to have the feedback, even while we haven't been able to be in front of the committee. But um, the bill was heard on Thursday. It was a seven and a half hour public hearing and um, the committee is going to start working the bill tomorrow. And with that, if we want to go to the next slide, we'll start about the sponsors amendment. So sort of our, our overarching goal was creating a collaborative program that's affordable, accessible, and straightforward for all Mainers. So purposes for leave. Um, throughout the program, we wanted our programs to line up as much as possible with current state law. So purposes for leave should mirror current state and federal law. So this includes to care for a new child, to care for a family member with a serious family, uh, serious health condition, one's own medical needs, and emergencies related to military deployment, as well as safe leave for victims of abuse. The only place that it varies from current state law is with affinity or kinship care, which we've seen a lot of um, concern, but also some misinformation around. This does not mean you can take leave to take care of your neighbor's cat. It means that you have to have a strong family bond that is documented. And this is not an outlier. Five out of the 12 states who have paid family medical leave have this type of definition and have seen no examples of fraud or misuse because of the high barrier of threshold to prove this connection. Additionally, the federal government has had affinity care as part of their leave for over 50 years. And the reason this is in our proposal and why the commission supported it unanimously is because of how old we are as a state and the need for folks to take care of each other. And we see a lot of senior caretakers are not direct blood, blood relatives. So employees covered, uh, we know and we heard loud and clear from other states, from private programs, from private companies, that for the program to be the most successful, it needs to be accessible. And so that's why we voted that all workers would be applicable for the program. Self-employed workers can opt in as someone who's self-employed. I think this is a really um, important thing for our state. Public and private employees would be covered, but private plans would be allowed. So if you currently have or offer a plan, you can continue to do so. And one of the other things that we really wanna have done through rulemaking is have a robust period to figure out how private plans would be um, you know, e exempted. So if you have that private plan, you and your employees do not have to contribute to the system. And additionally, we want to find a way that really recognizes the time off because we do know some employers might not have a strict paid family medical leave program, but when you stack up all the programs together, you get essentially the same benefit for wage replacement and time. So that's one of those areas we're asking for really clear rulemaking to help both our employees and our employers in the state. Next slide. So calculation of benefit. This is where everyone's heads tend to go to jelly a little bit. <laughs> So wages would be examined over a four quarter look back period. So that means when someone goes out on leave, they don't get what they were making the last week. You really is averaged out to be more fair and equitable. Um, our sponsor's amendment has changed from a flat reimbursement of 90% wage replacement to a tier that is closer to other states. Um, currently, your first 50% of your, your state average weekly wages, that's about roughly $500, is replaced at 90. And then anything of over that 500 is replaced at 75. We imagine as part of the negotiations with the committee, this is something that's gonna go down, um, but this was a good starting spot for us. Maximum benefit period, there's been some um, misinformation where folks are saying this is a 24 week program, absolutely not. It is a 12 week max 
for both things combined for both family and medical leave. Um, and this is not creating that stacking where they could take this and then the 12 weeks unpaid. We really see this program as the glue that holds together sort of the patchwork of laws that we have in our state. And this is a chance to sort of, you know, needn it up. And next slide. So the funding. So employers with fewer than 15 employees would be exempt from contributions to fund the program, but their employees would uh, be in the program. A lot of other states have this. This is something the committee went back and forth on, or the commission, about trying to figure out how we um, recognize how hard it is for small businesses. Also, the definition of small businesses, we kept going back and forth between both the federal definition and the main family medical law definite definition, which has 15 or more employees, which is how we ended up with this. Employers with 15 or more employees would contribute to the program cost based on a percentage of wages, and that percentage would be split evenly currently between the employee and the employer. The reason we did that is because it's just like Social Security. Those two items combined can never go above 1%. So a lot of people see 1% and they think that's everyone has to pay 1%. That's not it. The goal is actually um, probably closer to 0.7 or something like that combined, but we want this to, um, other states have run into trouble where they put a flat number into statute. And they've not been able to keep their funds solvent. And so this is sort of just setting the ceiling and allowing the number to be set by economists and actuaries who know more than all of us do as legislators. And states who've done this, like Massachusetts and New York, have actually seen their contributions continue to reduce over the years. And next slide. So one of the things that we've been really trying to figure out, and we've actually been getting a lot of heat for folks who are behind the referendum, we can go into a little bit of this on the referendum portion, is we wanted to acknowledge that we know what it's like to be in a seasonal economy and what it's like for hospitality and tourism and how someone taking leave in July is very different than someone taking leave in October. And so in our sponsor's amendment, we proposed a small business uh, exemption or hardship exemption. So what it is, is currently under main FML, you have to have 15 or more employees to qualify for the unpaid leave. And there are no job protections for those who are the 15 or under. Our sponsor's amendment says, if you're in one of those small businesses, you can access the leave, but you don't have job protected leave. So that means for your business, you know, should you have someone who needs to go out and leave and there's no way you can keep the position open, you have it built in that, you know, you would not have to keep that position open. Additionally, for businesses of all sizes, we have asked mirroring current law that employees when permissible or when possible give 30 days notice. And um, unless, you know, you, you don't know when the worst is gonna happen. So if someone gets in an accident, obviously that can't happen then, but then the employee and the employer need to agree. Additionally, um, one thing that I think folks get confused on and rightfully concerned is that, you know, this is something else that they're gonna have to be their own new HR department. The benefit of a state program is that the state administrator is the one doing the work. They're the ones collecting the paperwork, proving the claim, almost like your health insurance program. You won't have to have a new HR department for this if you're in the statewide program. And additionally, since the statewide administrator is the one doing the claim work and, you know, validating the claim, you know, your employee will tell you what's going on, you'll discuss what will happen, and then it's the responsibility of the administrator to let you know if that claim has been approved within five business days of the claim being submitted. We've gotten a lot of heat on this. We're looking at some other language to sort of firm up the hardship exemption. We'd also love to know if anyone else has any ideas, but we're trying to find that sort of middle ground. And one thing that gives us a little bit of reassurance is since the leave is not employer linked, even if that employee loses their job, they're still able to take the leave and then they'll have to re-enter the workforce. So it sort of empowers both sides to be able to get the care they need, but also be able to make sure the business keeps moving forward. And next slide. Do you want to talk about the the watchdog, Kristen? Sure. So um, one of the things that uh, we felt really needed to be, I guess, beefed up from what other states are doing um, is program evaluation and oversight. And so we like to refer that to that as the watchdogs. Um, and so we included photos of our own dogs on this slide. So Maddie's are at the top and mine are at the bottom. Um, and originally we were thinking about calling this um, an advisory board, but then really felt like we wanted uh, it to have more teeth than that. Um, and so we have decided to call it the PFML Benefits Authority. 
Um, and it's really sort of one of the most important pieces of the recommendations, both that came out of the commission, but also that we've refined um, over the course of our uh, work uh, in the sponsors amendment. Um, because time and time again, we had heard that um, we need to have a robust data collection mechanism and again, strong oversight of the program. So we have suggested a 13 person oversight authority um, that would be appointed by the governor uh, and have staggered three year terms. Um, and then on the right hand side of the slide, you can see what the membership would be. Um, and so really, again, try to be um, broad and inclusive um, in that membership, um, mirroring the membership of the commission in a lot of ways, but then also adding um, some additional representatives, um, including one of insurance carriers in the state, um, someone working in childcare, someone representing um, worker interests, um, and then also uh, including um, the state controller at the advisement of the um, Department of Labor. Um, and then Maddie, do you wanna talk a little bit about the fiduciary? Yeah, piece? so one of the things that um, would ensure the idea of having this level of oversight is making sure that you have the most robust board in the nation looking out for the financial interests of Mainers and of the fund. And so all members who are appointed will have a fiduciary duty to the fund. This is common within fund and trust law and talking to lawyers who work in that area. This is one of their biggest recommendations for um, making sure that you had a strong fund. And that means that they have to look out, obviously they bring your own lived experience to the board, but that they also have to look out for making sure that the fund is solvent and that it's responsive to taxpayers. Um, our idea here was to make sure that you have an entity that protects the fund, not only from inflation and economic fluctuations, but also protects the fund from politicians like Kristen and myself, or you know a governor who might not have the best view of it and make sure that it is really responsive to all of us and not just whomever's in power in Augusta. So the referendum, for those who are on the call who have not dug into this, we hate having to say this, we do not like operating with deadlines either. As you heard, we have spent years being careful and deliberative and really working on this. But the, the lay of the land, as I'm sure if anyone's read the press coverage, is that there is a citizen's referendum with enough signatures to be able to qualify for the ballot. The folks behind that have openly said that they would prefer a legislative solution, but basically have told us that if we are not able to pass at the legislature this year, that they will submit those signatures. The referendum has a lot of things that we have some concerns about. One, it hasn't had the same public process like we have done with this bill for the last three years, going to speak like folks like yourself. Additionally, it allows employees to take leave, job protected for any size. So that means you have to hold that job open, whether it's two people or 400 people in your business. Additionally, it allows people to take intermittent leave in chunks of an hour, which uh, we really felt from the commission standpoint is unworkable. It doesn't have the uh, robust authority or oversight protections that we put in. It also um, put some concrete numbers into statute that could have ramifications and not make it solvent in the future. And there's a whole bunch of other aspects. I know some people are just angry about it to begin with because they're not fans of citizens referendum, but we really feel the process we're going through now of having all the buy-in not only creates a better product, but will be better for employees and employers in the state of Maine. But we are operating within a little bit of an unfortunate sort of deadline that's been imposed by this coalition. We're not happy about it, but it's a reality in which we're operating in. So I think that sort of sums up, those are our, our emails. We'd love to hear from you if you have questions, but also if anyone on the call has questions or if you had anything submitted ahead of time or any things that you've been hearing from the chamber, we'd love to go through them. I have a couple of theater questions, but I'll wait to see if anybody has any questions on their own. Anybody have anything that they wanna? All right, I'll ask. Um, so I know one thing that came up um, when you did this session at um, the Jackson Laboratory, um, a question on some of our uh, good amount of our businesses here have seasonal employees um, and use the visa program. Um, how would that 
factor into the calculations with um, that 15 or more or 15 or less. <laughs> So asking the commissioner of labor, she said she, they would not factor in, they would not be part of the count, right, Kristen? Yes, and um, so I think that addresses the visa question. I think there's also the question of seasonal employees who aren't on the visa program. Um, and in terms of the, the 15 and under count, uh, it would be, um, I can't think of the word, a, it, you wouldn't look at just one spot in time. It would be over the course of the year. What's the word I'm looking for, Maddie? Uh, look back average. Yes, an average of um, of FTE over the course of the entire year. So mm -hmm. if you have, you know, 50 employees in the summer and five in the winter or vice versa, depending upon what your business is, um, it would take the average of the entire year as opposed to one one piece of time. And one other thing we want to make sure is we know people want to have an exact answer, but there are areas we've heard from other states um, that it's best to leave some things up to rulemaking because rulemaking will have legislative oversight as well as a public comment period again. And we want to suggest while the setup of this program is happening over the next few years that the rulemaking looks into how to do that employee count as well because Maine is a tourism based industry. And we need to make sure that we're building those protections in for those businesses and employees from the beginning. And also just a reminder, you know, contributions aren't going to start tomorrow. This still has a, a very robust ramp up period. That's one of the other changes with the referendum. It requires it to be in state government from day one and start rolling. Ours allows the Department of Labor to hire and contract with anyone they think who could help. And it also has a slower ramp up period. Took a little bit of my next question. I was going to ask, um, kind of when this gets if this gets signed in, how long would businesses have to kind of become compliant with it? So quite a good amount of time. So um, I believe that the so there's a the ramp up period is you be begin collecting contributions, but you don't start payouts for in this case about a year afterwards. I think we said, Maddie. Yeah. So we begin collecting contributions in January of 2025. And then um, benefits wouldn't be able to be taken until January of 2026. And additionally, there's yeah. the if the fund uh, will be continuously examined by actuaries to make sure that it's meeting its benchmarks. And if there needs to be an extension based on that science, there can be. Um, also, we're amenable to pushing, like making sure the timeline works for Maine. So if that's something we hear a lot from folks that they'd like a little bit more time, that's something we'd be happy to consider as well. And I know from my committee members, they've said the same too. Anybody have any, any questions? I'll just ask one last one then. Um, kind of um, if what are next steps from here and um, if someone wants more information, wants to look into the language of the bill, where can they find it online? So we have uh, our first work session tomorrow in front of the Labor and Housing Committee starting at 1. They will be working some other bills. So we imagine we won't get to the paid family medical portion until a little bit later. Um, also, uh, reaching out to us. Um, we can share our emails again with any ideas. Please let us know. Um, and yeah, Kristen, anything else I forgot there? I mean, I think that's it. It's unlikely that there will only be one work session on this, I think. Um, Maddie, you would know better than I do, but um, mm -hmm. then that there were seven hours of uh, testimony at the public hearing, I think this is going to be a, a multiple work session bill. Um, so we can definitely keep you updated on additional work sessions. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, you, ha you have your email addresses. We can definitely send you the link to where you can find the bill language and the sponsor's amendment online. Um, and you can share that with members. Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time and appreciate you doing the presentation for us today. <laughs> of course. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. Bye, everyone.